Hi all, we're going to look at game 10 of the recent World Championship match. In this game, Kramnik was white and he played d4, and then replied with knight f6. And after c4 we saw e6, so not the usual Slav, and after knight c3 we have mainline Nimzo Indian here. So named after Aaron Nimzovich, one of the greatest uh, thinkers of chess strategy. So black is pinning that knight, threatening to double white's pawns. Kramnik elects to allow that by playing knight f3, and now Anand actually plays c5. So he values the bishop pair, he doesn't want to give it up um, without first trying to encourage white maybe to play d5. Because if d5 is played, then that would be better for the black knight if um, the double pawns did occur with bishop takes c3. But actually Kramnik, he kept the tension in the position here by playing g3. So always asking the question, you know, will I play d5 or dc at any point, you know, which might be uncomfortable for black. But Anan decided to, to release the tension in the center straight away. He played c takes d4. And this does centralize the white knight here and give Kramnik, you know, a nagging advantage as we'll see uh, positionally. There's, uh, you know, quite unpleasant positional pressure which um, can be evolved here. So after bishop g2, it's obvious that the bishop is much superior than, than black's light square bishop. And this knight is, is currently in a good central position. The only real liability for white is actually this c4 pawn, but it's difficult to attack that for black without allowing, for example, knight b5s in some variations, or, or first queen b3. For example, if, if Anand had played queen c7 here, then queen b3 seems adequate to not only protect the pawn, but also attack the bishop. So, um, actually Anand decided to play d5. And now we saw c takes and knight takes. And now we saw queen b3. So protecting that c3 um, knight, putting pressure on d5, asking Anand, you know, what is he going to do about the knight? Um, but actually he leaves it there, he, he actually increases that pressure on c3, pins the c3 knight, reinforces the pin. After bishop d2, now knight c6, and after knight takes bc castles, Anand now takes on c3, so we end up with a symmetrical pawn structure here. But white has the pressure, and also the bishop pair, so this dark squared bishop can be potentially useful coming to f4, eyeing b8, and also these sensitive squares. So white's definitely got a small plus from the opening here. After bishop a6, now we see quite a clever move, rook f, d1. So the pawn cannot be taken because of c4. And actually, I'll just prove that if you, if you might think that the bishop's going to be attacking the queen, if bishop takes d1, then here just queen takes d1. So keeping that unveiled threat against the black queen to win the knight will give white a material plus. So basically, after this rook fd1, the queen is in effect forced to move. It moves to c5, and now e4. So white's gaining a little bit of space in the center, and trying to unravel the position for his two bishops. After bishop c4, queen a4, the queen remains quite annoying on the queen side, as we'll see. So targeting that poor a7 pawn is actually um, quite significant here, believe it or not, as we're about to see. So knight b6, and now queen b4. Black really doesn't want to connect white's pawns, because not only they will be uh, together, white could then use the c file to probe the c6 pawn. So really, black doesn't want that structural change. Instead, Anand played queen h5. So this might have some vague idea of attacking the white king, for example, bishop e2 to f3. But the positional pressure seemed to outweigh any attacking opportunities that Anand could generate, as we'll see. So rook e1, and after c5, black is committing a pawn, you know, to a dark square, which, which will be a liability for this dark square bishop. And it's here Kramnik pursues his queen side pressure with queen a5. So he's not really minding the black queen over here. It has no support. There's no attacking pieces to help that queen. Um, f5 would be, you know, too risky at the moment, definitely at the moment, because this bishop on this diagonal. So Really, white's position is quite secure tactically on the king's side. So, Anand plays rook fc8. He's forced to defend his queenside liabilities. 
But after bishop e3, we see bishop e2. So is Anand threatening in some relations to play bishop f3? But on the other hand, there's another point to this, to allow knight c4. Against this, um, actually Kramnik, he just plays bishop f4. So he's provoking Anand into another committal pawn move if the, if the bishop influence is... Um, wanting to be stopped here, and Anand's going to play e5. It is a concession, and that is what Anand played. Um, interesting is, is to consider knight c4, attacking the white queen. Let's have a quick look. Knight c4, what would Ribka think about this? Well, you know, maybe queen a6 here, and white still has this nagging pressure. If e5 now, then this gets a bit messy. You know, maybe bishop takes e5 is possible. Um, or maybe even bishop e3 is possible. Bishop takes e5 is, is an interesting move, trying to decoy the queen away from the protection of the bishop. Um, so if queen takes, rook takes, queen takes c3, white could end up with a small edge perhaps after rook e e1. So this bishop being um, nicely placed still on g2, and white can still push with e5 potentially, and still has nagging queenside pressure. But anyway, in the game, after bishop f4, Anand was provoked to, with another pawn move, so e5. And after bishop e3, now Anand did go in for this knight, um, sorry, he didn't go in for this knight c4, um, because here, let's, let's see, maybe you know some similar variations to before with queen a6. What he did do was play actually bishop g4, and now Kremnik played queen a6, so not waiting for that knight to come to c4, stopping it. But also the queen, as we'll see in the game, can be supported now by this bishop on g2. If it can reroute to f1, there's a lot of pressure on this diagonal. So here, Anand actually played f6. So in, in a way, he's trying to not only reinforce e5, but maybe the queen is going to be useful for the defense, you know, for like a7 and the 7th rank generally. But actually, this didn't seem to help Anand's um, defensive capability. After a4, queen, f7, bishop f1 was played, and we start to see a lot of threats emerging here. So the, the knight's getting um, to be quite awkward, because if it moves, then bishop c4 might be strong, or very strong, because um, the queen is also having an influence like this. So that would be actually winning if the knight moves. So what Anand did was bishop e6, and after rook a b1, there's a constant threat of a5 here. Anand fixed his pawn completely now with c4. So this actually does exacerbate the dark squared bishop pressure. Um, and now after a5, the knight went to a4, and this is very awkward because it can potentially be trapped here if it's not really threatening to win this pawn. But let's see, could it have gone to d7? If knight d7, then rook b7 is very strong, because this pawn, believe it or not, could become a critical um, winning factor. If white can win the pawn, this pawn's going to be a very dangerous pass pawn. So really, Anand tried to avoid that, and his position just, just became much worse now, after this knight a4. Um, because rook b7, queen e8, there was a crushing move here, which was played, which ignores the threat of the knight taking the pawn. Um, I'll give you five seconds to see if you can see it, starting from now. Okay, the move was queen d6, and it actually provoked a resignation from Anand, who was actually, at, by that stage, running out of time as well. So let's see, why is Anand's position so hopeless? If knight takes c3, then rook e7, and now white's just winning material, winning that bishop, so that's no good. If, say, bishop f7... Then queen b4, and how is um, this knight um, protected? So you say rook a1 is, is a threat now, trapping the knight. So say queen c6, trying to overload the white's queen. But here, instead of rook a1, maybe rook d1 is very strong, according to Ribka. So the idea is just to try and get both rooks on 7th rank. And if rook d8, then take, take... And now just rook takes a7, believe it or not, leave the knight stranded on a4, and try and queen this a pawn. So maybe, you know, this is part of the reason that Anand had felt it was time to resign after this very powerful queen d6. So not only supporting queen b4s, but also rook e7. And generally, 
you know, White's got this plan of also doubling up rooks if uh, the bishop moves from e6 to f7. So this is a very unpleasant position. Um, if rook d8, let's look at rook d8, queen b4, say rook d7, rook takes, bishop takes, and now bishop takes c4. So it seems Anand's pieces are quite overloaded here. There's a too many um, points to try and defend. The seventh rank, the c4 pawn, the knight, there's all sorts of tactical vulnerabilities in effect, including, uh, uh, you could call this seventh rank a positional vulnerability. But um, basically, Anand felt it was a hopeless position after queen d6 and resigned. So it was Kramnik's first win in this match and gave him some hope that he could maybe equalise um, the score and, and, and aim for a tie break. I hope you enjoyed that. Please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.